Welcome to the 109th episode uh, of Airhex TV. And this time is a little bit quiet, uh, which is good because the last time I skipped the um, time machine because there was uh, we got a uh, lots of questions. Um, we I got two last minute a really great question, so maybe it can even take longer than the last month. So uh, welcome everybody in the chat. And in the chat, I already got uh, an uh, interesting or uh, someone likes my shorts. So the Benjamin said, okay, uh, he really likes likes my shorts. Um, and he would like appreciate he would appreciate more uh, Quarkus related uh, uh, related uh, shorts. And uh, the problem is I have lots of Java SE ideas right now. So um, what uh, what um, what I plan to do is to cover Java SE, and then I have lots of ideas, of course, MicroProfile and Quarkus and Helidon, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, a short a day, so we cannot just, uh, I cannot just record all the time, I also have to work in between. Um, <clears throat> Benjamin asked me whether I know Sebastian Dashner. So uh, the origin story of Sebastian is Sebastian attended one of my air hacks in Munich workshop, uh, Munich workshop, Munich, um, Munich Airport, <laughs> one of my workshops at Munich Airport, and uh, and uh, and then he became, you know, uh, an independent consultant, and uh, yeah, we are in touch, a nice guy, and yeah, I know Sebastian Daschner. Um, yeah, we can we can do it one one, one time. Um, yeah, uh, Zoltan, hi. So, um, okay, cool. So uh, let's start now with the very first question. Uh, ah, thank you, everybody. So I'm glad you like the shorts. I also like the shorts because for me it's fun. You know, I can record two lines and everyone is happy. So, uh, oh, and Tiago uh, Lino, friend of the show. Um, I, I, Tiago, of course, the question is, I think, uh, is it hot in Brazil is the first question. And the next question is, of course, um, how far you got with Airhex TV, right? So, now because I see here, Simon, uh, I spent uh, last week, there were three conferences in one week. It was crazy week. And um, there was one Java user group in-person conference um, in uh, Java user group Zurich, which was great. Um, I, I presented the ideas about cloud and serverless for enterprise developers, and we had a lot of discussion during the session and afterwards. And in the morning, at the, at the same day, this was also fun, uh, the problem is to reach Zurich, um, the problem is I had in the morning a session which was online for a cloud builder session. And at the same time, at the same day, I had to travel to Zurich. So for me, it was only doable to book a room at the Munich airport, this is the usual airhacks.com room, and I streamed live from 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 Munich, and then you know went by car to Zurich in one day, so which was crazy. So the first time I was there was no you know uh, behind me you know a wallpaper of the uh, of the airport Munich. Uh, this was the really airport Munich, and I was a little bit distracted during the session because of the airplanes. So I know I looked through the window, I, I saw you know the the airplanes. Okay. This was the uh, this week, and this is a good idea, which I wanted also to cover serverless in the workshop here. Okay, so um, let's start with the show. Now, um, question number one, uh, do you TTD? Someone asked me, I think it was in the Discord channel, so I uh, forgot to promote that. Discord and the name of the public server is Airhex. You are just welcome. Nice crowd. A little bit quiet right now, which is good, but there are, uh, um, yeah, this is just, you know, fun. And they asked me whether I do the test-driven development, and this um, caused some more discussion, and I even had some on Twitter, um, a survey or a poll, uh, you know, uh, what is the state of test-driven development. So what's about me? So what I, I, I don't know whether I would call it test-driven development. So what happens in my case is I'm... Um, I'm doing the following. So uh, usually if I have to write, um, or what I did at the beginning of Java, that's interesting. So um, if I wrote some code, uh, it usually broke because the IDEs were not so good. So what I did is I wrote a lot of main methods, right? So I had a main method, and this main method started, you know, the code. And this was my test because I wanted to keep the application running. If you waited for too long, there were chances were low that it would even compile. So this was the reality back then. 
So, uh, and then JUnit came out. It was okay. This is a little bit stupid. What I didn't like is the idea that uh, that the 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 you know the unit testing um, influences the the design of my code. This is what I really hated back then. I remember. But I, I misused JUnit, so I threw, threw away, you know, the main methods. And so, okay, I would just use JUnit instead of main methods. And uh, this works well to even to today. And what I'm actually doing sometimes, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is really fast. I'm writing production code in unit test. Not to know, I don't have even a class, uh, uh, not even a production class. I write the entire code in JUnit and then copy the entire method over to the production class and then reference this class from a JUnit test. I don't know how to call it. <laughs> For fun on Twitter, I call that um, ultra, um, ultra test-driven development, right? So and and um, so, but I, if I'm you know on Quarkus, MicroProfile, or Jakarta E projects, what I they're usually at the beginning fairly simple. There's not lots of logic going on. So I don't write JUnit tests at all, but I'm writing system tests. So I'm starting with system tests. And this is similar somehow. So what happens then is I write the Jaxores class first, start, for instance, Quarkus. If Quarkus starts, I do a simple curl. And then I, and then I copy this Jaxores resource to a Java interface, call this resource client, inject the interface to a system test. And, this is, and, then, I, and, and then I don't use curl anymore. I use the system test instead. So this is what happens. Okay. So this was the first question. As uh, it was asked three weeks ago, I think on Discord, I think, and uh, there are already two polls on Twitter. The one stops um, or yeah ends today, and um, yeah, this is what I'm doing. Um, and I don't like you know test-driven development or you know uh, what was called uh, extreme programming, whatever. It's just names. It should be reasonable, I would say, right? So, but um, I would say usually. I, I test for speed. I like, you know, to write unit code because I can minimize, you know, the errors and I move faster because I exactly know what happens if I don't write unit tests. I'm assuming, you know, the trivial code will work. And then if it doesn't, I will, you know, search for errors for hours. So this is this is the sad reality. So what's going on here? Oh, wow, the chat is crazy, which is really cool. cool. Um, so uh, the... Um, Alex, Micronaut Alex, and Java SE serverless Alex is there, and um, and um, the question is um, interviews. What do you mean, mean, mean MG Gaming? But I am not familiar with all the questions that come up in the interview. He answered most of the questions correctly, but there are always new things. I don't pass advice to me. So the MG Gaming, which interview do you mean? Um, but um, I, I mean a yeah, job interview, right? Um, you, you cannot pre prepare for job interview. Um, so I, I don't know what you mean with with interview, and um, how to prepare for interview. Um, what I can tell you, you now, try to speak more than you, you know the interviewer, and try to you know to show you knowledge, and then you get the job regardless whether you answered all the questions correctly or not, right? So uh, Tiago says in Brazil it's not so hot and it's already an 81st episode, so it's not that far. So uh, uh, so kudos to you. Um, extraction test driven. Hey, Musha, absolutely. Extraction test driven. ETD. This is what I'm doing. You are absolutely right. Um, Tiago asked me in 80th episode or says you showed a Java E to 6 8 to migration, only PomXML changed. Um, so what's also cool um, in uh, it was prior to episode eighty, I think, because it was in the year two thousand twelve or something. So what I did then on stage, or maybe we already uh, uh, said on, on here is um, w what I did in one conference JDD ten years ago. I wrote, um, I delivered a session with Java six. The future is now, and ten years uh, later, I showed how to migrate this to a serverless environment, which is uh, interesting. Um, uh, Maldi asked me, I was wondering which GC you usually use in production and why. I go with the default right now, and I didn't have any problems with GCs for years. And uh, right now, most of my projects are Lambda-based, and then GC doesn't matter a lot, I would say, right? Because usually the Lambda goes away after a few calls. Um, 
Do you use web jars? I tried them. I'm not using them um, uh, anymore. Um, yeah, GC garbage collector, I think, right? Uh, ah, what questions uh, do you ask on interviews when hiring? Okay, um, I was, uh, Tiago said, uh, right, JDD uh, 2012. So, uh, Tiago, you are, are you AI, right? Are you chat GPT? You are a personal, uh, this is amazing, Tiago. Um, so, um, what question would I ask, uh, ask right, during hiring? Um, so, what I will ask you is, for instance, um, why you like computers? Or I would ask you, you know, what's your favorite editor? Uh, what's your on the desktop? And uh, why you like Java? And what do you enjoy the most? And if I would see that you are interested, you would get the job. <laughs> and this would be my interview, right? So maybe there will be the most crowded uh, company ever. But um, I think to memorize things, I'm not interested in it. If someone is passionate, um, he will just do the job perfectly in shortest amount of time. This is my personal opinion, but I'm not a job, you know, not, not an job interview expert. Um, okay. Maven versus Gradle. And there is another section about that, and um, and also comes I think from uh, from either conference or um, or um, I think it was no, it is the backlog from the last uh, AHEX TV, so I didn't answer this. And Maven versus Gradle for me uh, is like a Maven is, or uh, Maven reminds me of infrastructure as code a bit. It's just declarative; it just declares to you know what to do, and it just happens. And Gradle is the build programming environment for me. And because I, 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 I use Maven just to compile and package and nothing more, uh, and I prefer also that the entire automation happens in the pipeline and not with Maven, therefore I don't like to have you know Gradle because I don't like the power. Having said that, if you do Android development, you have to use Gradle, right? So I mean, uh, I'm just speaking about enterprise development or not enterprise development, development with MicroProfile and Jakarta E. This is what I'm talking about. Okay. So Time Machine. Uh, now back to Time Machine. So I prepared here the Time Machine. Where is it? So, uh, so this is the episode. Oh, this, here is it. So let's take a look. And um, we will have a question uh, regarding uh, serverless uh, enterprise Java later. But in the uh, 100 episodes ago, in the um, in the eighth episode or 100 101st episode, um, we had resilience in discovery, and there was a question: What to do? No, I just just, just abbreviated. Um, and what stuck me both episodes, 100 episodes ago, I could actually re-ask the same questions and I will answer exactly the same way. So they were up-to-date questions. So let's see. Uh, discovery a little bit less. I, there were lots of questions regarding discovery. I have to tell you, I never had a problem with discovery because I always had DNS. So I just named, you know, the services properly. And this was my discovery. So this was, that's all. With Docker, I named that after how, how, how the war was named and was always you know, able to find this. And uh, in the cloud right now, we have a private DNS and public DNS, and this is what we do. Resilience. So uh, the most important thing about resilience is timeouts, and then we use you know, microprofile fault tolerance. Back then, you had to implement interceptors, whatever, and now it's uh, microprofile uh, fault tolerance. OData is still a very interesting framework, but it's not that popular. What OData is, it comes from Microsoft, and uh, it's self it is a little bit like Graph GraphQL. And you can this or this is like exposed database SQL via you know REST. This is maybe a little bit. What I don't like is our dynamics convection is still interesting. Then you know a classic question, lazy one to many uh, uh, with JAXRS, how to do this still no problematic. Um, if you have a lazy relation, you have to load it. But what happens? I I got the questions. Uh, the, the exactly these questions. I think the last time a few years ago, and the reason being is usually what happens is currently, as my uh, the database got simpler. This is my this or not simpler, more chaotic, right? So um, back then everything was normalized. So we had hundreds of table, and this is why we had lots of one to many relations. I think in 2023 it's absolutely okay to have you know a denormalized database with you know uh, a, a huge amount of data in one table, for instance. Uh, simple reporting solutions, also very quiet, right? So uh, back then, there were uh, lots of um, um, uh, report solution. The uh, Eclipse BERT was one of the most uh, no, interesting one. 
And um, I, I think what happens right now is usually, you know, if you, for instance, um, at AWS right now, we use uh, CloudWatch. With CloudWatch, you can have metrics, and with metrics, you, you can create your dashboard, and this is simple enough, right? And um, if you, um, so it, what means it become even re less relevant? API gateways, also interesting. Back then, I remember everyone wanted to hear about API gateways and Java E, and I never got, you know, the idea why you need API gateways, actually. And now I have to use API Gateway. Actually, I'm using a lot because uh, API Gateway is the way to expose AWS Lambda as uh, as HTTP service. So the, the, the thing is called HTTP API Gateway. So, But I'm just using the proxy integration, no additional features. Centralized API management, I would say, is less common, right? So I think no one asked me about that for years, N not even with projects. But um, what's what's happens? This API uh, uh, gateway I told you right now is able to you know to to document and expose APIs, and um, enum serialization options um, still I think um, I remember recently we had to serialize enums in JSON, so it was also you know the idea how to serialize it. Uh, and um, but back then the question is was in the database should we use the ordinal or the names? There's always you know, and um, with JSON of course I will go for 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 name never for the ordinal or for the index in enum. And um, also a classic one, a row level authorization in Java E. This is a the question comes um, every time. And the interesting part is if you're in the cloud and use databases like DynamoDB, and I'm pretty sure Cosmos DB never did it with Cosmos DB. This is row level security is even a um, um, uh, standard feature. So so you can say okay, uh, who has access to which you know to which row? Um, you can you can decide that. Um, so now. Let's go to the ninth episode. Um, the question is, you know, batch processing or scheduler? Still, EJB scheduler less so, but even if you, you know, uh, are in the cloud and you have, you know, you, you can use the Kubernetes scheduler or, you know, uh, event bridge scheduler. The question is, do we need, you know, um, a batch framework or just a timer, a scheduler, and what's the difference? And I would say the difference is um, that the uh, that a batch framework, what a batch framework will do for you is, you know, it will provide you checkpoints and commits, so it can just commit, 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 and then roll back. You know, if, if something breaks, you have a checkpoint, and you can you know restart the batch processing from the from the from the checkpoint. And 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 uh, the scheduler is just you know a timer invokes you. This is the scheduler. So access to user specific database for caller users. So this was a question. I have multiple database, and I would like like uh, something like a routing. Well, uh, with uh, Entity Manager, the same solution right now. You can do this with CDI. You can say you know depending on the on the principle. I'm I'm like a if else statement even or switch statement. Switch expression would be great, by the way. A switch expressions that were depending on the principle. I'm just pulling different. So what I did back then, I remember. Uh, still remember also this is almost almost 10 years ago and I will do this the same way right now I would for instance inject five different entity managers and in a switch expression which was not available back then um, and uh, depending on the name of the principal I will fetch the right entity manager and return it for instance um, so and and someone uh, said okay um, Spring is, uh, is 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 great because Spring can be de deployed to, to to various application server containers, and right now Spring Boot uh, can live without application containers. So I would I would say this advantage is gone. Um, manage deployed framework status health check or managing deployed framework status health checks and restarting. Interesting part status is uh, um, micro profile standardized that health check as well and restarting is a no go right now. Right, interesting because. Uh, um, uh, the services get restarted automatically by a Docker orchestrator. Local and production Docker setup. Funny enough, today I got exactly the same question, so we'll cover this later. JSF and JavaScript frameworks. I would say JSF is still there. So in one of my projects, we had to migrate JSF to cloud, so it works still perfectly. We use uh, Prime Faces still. Developers love it. I would say so. Uh, the only problem with JSF is you have to be a little bit uh, cautious. Is uh, it can be stateless, but in most cases, uh, JSF is set up to be stateful, and you have to to set up the load balancer. Optimistic lock exceptions automation of the recovery. So this was uh, an, a, you know I got the question all the time, and optimistic lock exception less so. So what is optimistic lock exception? So um, we, we have an entity. We go to database. And uh, every update changes the version in the database. But um, if you fetch the entity, 
it remembers, of course, because it's a copy, the last version. And on write, we compare the copy with the actual version. If there is a change, we know someone else modified the database. So this is how optimistic logs are working. So um, and uh, there's no automatic recovery because, of course, you have to know you know what to do. And um, or I mean, what you could do, of course, you can you can try and try and try until you can override the data in the database. But what means is actually. Maybe you are overriding with stale data, someone else's data. This is the automatic recovery. A true automatic automation, automatic recovery would be a diff, merge a diff, like, you know, git. This is actually, this is the same question. Can we have, you know, automated uh, uh, git merge conflict resolution? Git conflict resolution, right? This is the, the same question. And session storage in Jakarta E. Um, so um, session also no still up to date. So in the cloud, you would use Redis, for instance, as session storage. Or uh, right now, we even write to S3 uh, the session because uh, we don't have real time environment um, requirements. And yeah, then we are almost stateless. If you can consider something which is stateless, which writes to S3. So let's see. Um, so we covered all the odd questions. Let's see in uh, in the chat. Um, okay. So Gradle is fast. Faster than Maven. LTS, this is not true. Um, uh, Tiago will maybe know. I showed this several times in uh, in AHEX TV. So um, we launched Maven, we, we launched Gradle, and Maven was faster So in for, 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 for this. Of course, if you do more, this is always no, your, your, how it's called, your mileage may, may vary. But uh, Maven is just fast enough. And uh, in CI, CD, um, we don't use Maven a lot. Or we use Maven, but we... Um, we don't have, you know, Maven clean package do everything. Is rather than I do Ma Maven clean compile skip tests, Maven test, Maven face safe integration test, Maven package, then you know deploy, then switch to system test, Maven face safe uh, how it's called uh, um, integration tests for instance, right? So, uh, could you please some advice about? Our production. So Maldi, I, I don't know what you do in production. So what is the question exactly? So um, what you can do in production is, um, I don't know what, what you mean by that. You mentioned load balancer for JSF. How do you set it up? Um, the JSF uses, I think, if not JSON session, J session ID, something uh, similar. And for instance, in AWS load balancer, you can tell, you know, which, uh, which, um, um, how to call it, which variable is important and then the load balancer will route everything with this with the value of the variable always to the same node. This is what should happen, right? Okay. Uh, uh, would you use system out in prod environment? I'm using this right now uh, for lambdas and the reason being is in lambda there is no concurrent um, invocation if there is no concurrent invocation system out print line works just perfectly and system out print line writes to cloudwatch is good enough but what i never use system out print line directly what i usually tend to use uh, to do is use an interface with static methods like info warning and uh, whatever this is just what a message static methods i made up and system out print line is just called there so what i can do later is i can uh, provide an if statement and just decide that the debug statement is unlocked, for instance. Um, we are using Quarkus for production. Yeah, my, but uh, for production, uh, I would say, for me, there is no difference between int and production. I would say in int, we have you know, the settings which are working. What I always do, maybe what I, maybe what, how, how I'm approaching things, right? So I do nothing. I like defaults. If default works well, I go with default in production. So that's the thing, right? But um, if if I see something can be optimized, because I suspect you know may, maybe you know the garbage collector can be tuned on more memory, whatever. Then of course I will do it in int first and then in production. So this is what I would suggest, or not would suggest. This is what I suggest. Okay, I think we covered this, and you can just this was the, the original questions you know uh, ten years ago, crazy, and the same here. And um, now podcast, interesting. So we had an interesting episode with Sasha of AWS. Another one with Shai Almonk. Almok, he is a um, um, an, an Sun consultant, and he did uh, great things, you know, with low-level Java and uh, Sun Spotless VM, for instance. And now he writes a book about uh, uh, debugging. So um, 
by this by his book, uh, his debug agent on Twitter. Then uh, I also invited was also interesting um, a friend of the show of the AX TV show. Um, uh, no, the, those are Twitter and you know, all conversations regarding data transfer object or not, and JPI body can, is able to 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 generate data transfer objects. So I um, invited Alexei to my to my to, to the podcast, and we had a discussion. Also, um, um, uh, interesting discussion about the Apache Roller. This is block I'm using actually, and um, also this was uh, this was uh, uh, fun. Um, I actually had a conversation with Kelsey Hightower about Kubernetes. And he's um, a Google evangelist for Kubernetes. And uh, I also know we had a, at the end uh, the discussion, YAML, I said, I don't see the point why, you know, YAML is just you know, crazy. And he said, okay, it was never supposed to leak. You know, the entire Kubernetes low-level plumbing was never supposed to leak. Kubernetes was always meant to, 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 to be a platform which is not touched by developers. It just use Kubernetes, you know, to manage your cloud, but they are just deploying to somewhere, right? So... Okay, this, um, the workshops will take place, so there are uh, sufficient uh, registrations already, so if you like, attend, would be fun. And now back to the to the real question. So, um, so and Maven versus Cradle. Why all tutorials for Spring are with Maven and not with Grace? Uh, I have no idea. I have to tell you, Misha, um, I have... I have actually no Spring experience, so I, I was, you know, by accidental by accident in one project where I tried to help, you know, to fix things. Uh, it was not fault of Spring, but they thought I don't know why they uh, found me and they assumed that they had Jakarta EE, but they had Spring, and I said yes, and I saw that there's not Jakarta EE rather than Spring, and um, I had them, you know, with the project, but this was not uh, it was just Java was not used as supposed to, right, and. Uh, and this was my only Spring experience, and this project works worked well. But since then, I never saw Spring again in my projects. Um, so, uh, and why Spring uses uh, Gradle? I don't, no idea. Maybe my you know my listeners know, or or the or you know join uh, Ahex the Ahex Discord. Maybe someone knows there, but I have no, no insight why it's the case. Um, so then, Mister Friend of the Show Daniel uh, asked me. Um, about serverless, and um, I would I will have to read reread it. So I actually read it. It's okay. This question is great, but maybe we can spend you know two hours just talking about this. And um, so is he. Um, what is the real benefits of going serverless? Because serverless is not really serverless as everything is hosted on a server. Exactly as NoSQL is not NoSQL because all NoSQL solutions have uh, NoSQL, right? I have actually a client of mine in Angola who is only swearing by it. And um, one of his developers showed you your use of serverless functions. So gr this is crazy. So you are saying that someone in Angola watched my video and now you have to implement serverless solutions. This would be you know, incredible, <laughs> I have to say. Um, yeah, but uh, thank you for watching my stuff. And he would like uh, me to write a complete application, a border control using Raspberry Pi and connect it to a remote server, and a bu bus ticket control also based on Raspberry Pi using SMS. I think SNS, right? Not SMS. I think if it's an AWS, it's SMS. And I pers personally don't see why I should go serverless for that. Yeah, it's just, yeah, I also don't see this. You, you could do this, you don't have to. Why? Um, in case I do and don't want to use AWS, is there any open source platform or product that I could install to go serverless? Yes, Knative Kubernetes, but it does make a lot of sense, I would say. First during my implementation and after that going live. Or take a look at FN, FN uh, Java. This is uh, Project FN. This is also a serverless solution for Java. Now, um, this is interesting because uh, this conversation happens more often and it's also a topic of the actually of the Java user group Zurich and also the Cloud Builders Conference. And I said, okay, this is an interesting topic I would like to talk about. So first, serverless, the name is stupid. Of course, they are servers. So, uh, so, but at the other hand, the serverless term makes absolute, ab absolute uh, no, no sense. So why? I thought, you know, um, about analogy. So let's say um, I'm I'm a grid power grid provider, right? So what what I could say is the power is generator less. Why? Because in order to get power from grid, you don't have to maintain your own generator. So you can say, you know, I get the power from the power provider, 
you know, electricity, and I get the electricity, or so I don't care about generators. This is generator-less electricity. And of course, everyone knows without generators, of course we have you know, uh, uh, the uh, PV, you know, uh, photovoltaic panels, and, uh, but uh, say there will be no photovoltaic, everything we would need to you know generator for that. So, and of course, prior to electricity, maybe there were no companies who maintained you know, their own generators. And now the power plant provider comes and says, look, we, you can also have gener generator-less electricity if you come to us. This is how I can see serverless. So what it means is um, serverless means uh, it's like Java E next, Jakarta E next. It means you don't care about the plumbing. You can just push you know, your application to the cloud and uh, you are done. Um, so in your particular case with the border control, it can make sense because um, if you would use something which runs on Docker, you will have to pay at least, I would say, 50 euros a month. At least, I would suspect more. But in, in your case, if you know your Raspberry Pi pings you know, the cloud on, uh, on every passing of the border, and uh, you have one million you know, people passing over the border, maybe the solution will be completely free. So I would say it makes sense from security perspective, economical perspective, from the development perspective, there is no difference. So you're right. We developers, I could you no know, run my micro profile code, micro profile code on. Actually, I had a slide usually micro profile I can run on bare metal in Docker or serverless. I don't care because it looks identical. So, uh, but from economical perspective, from even you know um, ecological perspective, serverless make, can make sense. Why this? Because if the functions are not used. They are they are they are just that you know they are on the disk and are just that are hibernated, and uh, and I told you that the open source uh, solutions could could make you know less sense. Reason being is because uh, usually uh, a hyperscaler like uh, for instance uh, Azure they also support functions, uh, Oracle supports functions and the project FN function comes from Oracle. Uh, Google supports functions, but I think, uh, not I think, AWS was the first. So uh, they started with the Lambdas. And uh, so I think something like Lambda or, or Cloud Functions make only sense in case you have a huge amount of hardware. Because, you know, if you have a huge amount of hardware, you cannot, you cannot utilize or, or use the, you cannot utilize the systems to 100%. And with functions, you have the opportunity to run the function on an idle CPU. So this is why you can, you know, use your hardware more. And this makes sense. But if your data center is overloaded anyway, with, you know, cloud functions, it gets even, it gets even uh, overloaded even more. This is the problem I see. So I would say serverless for me, it is like, you know, uh, a, a, a convenient solution where I can say, um, or convenience, uh, how to call it, um, um, maybe political correct often, you know, solution because I can say, or management compatible solution where I say uh, the cloud should support more services. I don't care about operating systems and, and patches or whatever. Everything has to be uh, done by the cloud. And then, of course, uh, I can focus on my business logic. If something is goes wrong, it is fault of the cloud. So this is, you know, this is uh, what I wanted to express. Okay, let's take a look on the chat. So I think um, ah, uh, someone asked me a podcast topic suggestion. Invite a Spring Advocate developer to convince you to use Spring. Uh, I would say there's nothing to convince me because uh, the, the, my clients have to be you know, uh, happy with the so solution. And if they're happy and we can deliver on time and then everyone is happy. And it's not like I have to use microprofiles or in the serverless Lambda solutions. Sometimes I don't even use Quarkus. I just use Java SE. So I actually try to get rid of microprofile and Jakarta E altogether. I'm just happy with Java SE in some projects. So uh, I think the solution would be to invite, you know, an, an Java SE advocate to show us, you know, how to get rid of all the frameworks. This is, would be the end game, right? So, but uh, with Spring and Quarkus, are very uh, similar, and what happens in my projects, I see, you know, in the workshops, there were attendees, uh, Alexander also uh, knows them, he also attended the, the AHEX, 
um, who uh, migrated from Spring to Micronaut or Quarkus, you know, because uh, the startup time of Spring um, was uh, slower and, and they, they hoped, you know, to save some money with Quarkus or Micronaut. So I would uh, don't think, you know, Spring is bad. And, um, but um, I mean, why I should learn it? And uh, right now, if there is no advantages over Quarkus, let's say. And, um, and the, uh, m maybe it's interesting, you know, why I never use Spring, right? And and the story is maybe interesting um, because I started with Java on J2E from 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 the beginning, and what I never liked is the XML. So I try, you know, as Xdoclet, it was called attribute oriented programming. Um, indeed, with Xdoclet, they um, I, I used immediately what Xdoclet was. This was prior to annotations. You could uh, you can use in Java doc comments doclets and they generated all the XMLs so I didn't have to care now about uh, XML and the problem with that was of course was a little bit slow so and then you know annotations came out and they replaced the doclets with annotations but at the same time Spring still believed in XML there was huge amount of XML and I said okay I, I, I don't like to use it so I just I don't like to use it and period so I tried you know to to just you know to get rid of or just not you know be in projects where Spring was used with the XML and in some project XML was longer than Java. Of course, it's fixed everything, but this is you know the history why I'm using Java all the time because in in that time I uh, had a lots of clients, lots of projects, and you know, and this is how it happened. So uh, this is the history. Um, okay, uh, J session ID. Yeah, um, J session ID. I guess that means you store sessions in memory. Um, so um, yes, in memory usually, and in database you could store the sessions in a database. Then, of course, the performance is worse, and the uh, session can still disappear. So um, I always state uh, saved sessions in memory. The reason being is because in my eyes, session was never meant to be transactional and persistent. And if the session has to be persistent, then we'll write it to the database. You're right. So. Um, yeah, um, there are different opinions regarding uh, uh, Spring. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there. Yeah, uh, uh, Tiago, you are right, but there is actually nothing to fight, right? So there is enough room for everyone. And uh, I'm a little bit lazy. I focus always on standard. I try not not to learn too many frameworks. This is uh, my this was my strategy, and worked well so far. And uh, yeah, this is why I still stick with Java, right? And still stick, you know, with uh, the standards, and uh, st c can do stunts like at the conference ten years after, where you know uh, after. Ten years ago, I, did, I implemented a, an, an application with Java EE, and it looks identical right now, and I can deploy it as, as Lambda. I would say this is a unique success, success story, if you think about this. And everything is documented on YouTube, <laughs> right? So it seems to work. And this is what my clients are liking. So, But if I would, you know, jump from framework to framework and from language to language, so there would be no stability, then I would say, okay, what we are doing here, right? So, okay. Nice. So I have still questions here. And Fabian asked me, uh, multiple containerized services. So um, funny, funny fact, I think for two years I didn't use containers anymore. Everything is uh, just a, a zip and serverless. But um, ask me what to do. So what I did uh, two years ago, if I started with, I still used uh, Dockers. First, there was no difference between production and this was my, 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 uh, my uh, main, how to call it? goal maybe no difference between production and development this was also what i tried to achieve um and this is also oh by the way this is also a great benefit of serverless because you can have as many environments as you like and they are usually don't cost you anything or are very cheap and um and um uh, so in in your particular case um for instance openshift this is what i use also uh, dockers a lot so what i did then is i had my own mini shift i think yeah mini shift environment locally and just deployed to my local environment with MiniShift, but there was no difference to the to the production OpenShift, right? So um, the question, let's see. In our current project, we have multi-stage Dockerfile for local development and production build. So uh, what means for local development and production build? I would assume it's the same, right? There's no no thing. So Docker Composer tried to get rid of, 
because um, um, I, I use it in, in, for instance, the last time I used Docker Compose is just in a, in a training or a workshop to show you this. It actually works well. Um, what I will do, or let's say even worse, what I do in serverless projects right now where I have the cloud, right? So there's the same question. Do I use in local stack? The answer is not. No, I'm starting Quarkus locally as Java process, which is a microprofile server. Or so this is a Lambda, actually. It behaves like a microprofile server. And then the Quarkus can access cloud resources. So there is nothing you know, to do for me. I don't have to mock out uh, everything. And because it accesses my dev account, it is a dev stage. Int account, int stage, and prod account, prod stage. So this is what happens usually. Okay, uh, but it really depends. It seems like you have a, a legacy application because you have volume mounts is a little bit more complicated. So um, git ignored end files, this is a good idea because not everything has to be packaged to, 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 to Docker. And um, so... And the question is, when working with the cloud or Kubernetes separation between local productions more clear? I often see infrastructure repository or ham files, but I'm trying to minimize setup config in all environments. So this is why I tend not to use Kubernetes, because Kubernetes reminds me on old Spring with XML and XDocklet with the Helm charts. For me, it is just the same craziness. So um so maybe the difference is I'm not use Kubernetes a lot. If I have to use Docker, I'm using actually a Docker right now in a project. Forgot about that. It's this Whitefly project. So in this particular project, we use a Fargate. So there is actually no plumbing with CDK. So there is we have just the Docker file, which is created as a local one. It is pushed to ECR. And then and there is no, there's just Java configuration there. So CDK, we say, you know, is this, I think it's called load balance cluster. We have, uh, and then we started to create our own construct, but uh, there is, there's is no configuration. So um, maybe the difference is what I'm using as infrastructure as code. I use Java to on AWS and on Azure Bicep. This is the name of the language. And uh, to set up the environment. And um, I, in the public cloud, I not use Kubernetes at all, only on premises. In my eyes, in public clouds, Kubernetes is less... I don't see any advantage, I have to say, on, in public clouds. On private clouds, clearly I see an advantage, but I would run my own you know, OpenShift or Rancher, which are really convenient. And uh, in OpenShift, I don't have to play with ham charts usually. So uh, what setup uh, am I using? A view shell scripts, and I have Docker Compose in rare cases, usually not. Um, and... Um, yeah, for instance, like database, right? Docker Compose, I can start my Postgres, which uh, calls locally, or I can uh, start my Postgres in the cloud. That, that That's the question, right? So this is... Um, so, um, Fabian, so um, my approach would be to try production-like environment as much as possible. So this would be... And this is why, you know, my system test, I would push CICD runs in my dev environment, and I have, you know, my environment, and it's automatically tested with system test. This is what I believe. And I believe lesser in you know, trying to replicate the production environment in dev environment. And in the cloud, I would say, we have the unique opportunity to have you know, production-like environment for everyone. So. Um, so from Java to Kotlin, um, what, um, uh, so no idea about Spring Boot, but I saw this in Quarkus. And I have to say, uh, I, I saw the Kotlin code in Quarkus, and for me, there was no advantage. To be honest, so for me, uh, uh, they were always different. Maybe the uh, developers are bored with Java, and they try Kotlin. This is my suspicion because you know with uh, Java 17, this is very lean, and, and and of course it looks Kotlin looks different. But um, my Java E or, or microprofile code is already extremely lean. If I remove one or two lines, it doesn't matter. But Alexander, um, I, Alexander Spakovsky in the last Airhex uh, workshop or even Airhex TV had you know, a, a good point. He said, okay, the, in, uh, in, in Kotlin, we have, I think it's called the Elvis operator, where you know, of the, you know which also is, uh, supported the um, question mark operator in JavaScript, for instance. It's not available in Java. This I would see a advantage where I can navigate you know, a deep, uh, deep path of JSON but what I use in Java JSON path, okay, this is not as convenient as Kotlin, but also works for me. So I, I would say Kotlin is great, but Java is good enough. This would be my, you know, this is like, if you, someone asks me why I'm not driving Ferrari or Porsche, I'd say, okay, because uh, Ford also works, right? So this is, yeah, you, you could, of course, is, uh, Porsche or Ferrari is, is, is great, 
but uh, I don't need it, you know, to go shopping. So this is this is the discussion here. And um, and by the way, um, if you look, uh, there is no. Um, I even created a blog post. Um, wait a sec, maybe I will find this. Uh, it's called uh, Adam Bean. Why are you not using programming language? Maybe I will find this. Uh, yeah, perfect. So, and I got the questions all the time. Every year I got asked, you know, why I'm not using Perl, Python, Jython, Groovy, Scala, Ruby on Rails, CoffeeScript, Salon, uh, Clojure, Dart, TypeScript, and now Kotlin. So, and I'm pretty sure next year everyone will ask me, you know, why I'm not using whatever, right? So, that's interesting. Um, okay. Let's see. So, just reload here. And perfect. So, what's interesting here, let's see. I almost forgot about that. So this is an uh, this is a a paper from Google, and it measures the energy efficiency of Java, and uh, or programming languages. Sorry, and Java is on the number five, and the uh, uh, Ruby, Python are down there with orders of magnitudes and no verse characteristics, which which actually says that Java, if you, if you take a look at Java, it actually looks great everywhere, except this is memory. Uh, I think this is memory, so the memory consumption is not that great, which means Java is great for serverless because you need in, to have, you know, a few CPUs uh, on uh, AWS. You have, to have one CPU, you have to buy 1.7 gig of RAM. So what it means, you have plenty of, of memory. Uh, memory is cheap. CPUs are not that cheap. And yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. What's the questions here? Um, in today's ecosystem, Spring is not the uh, leader anymore. Maybe. I, I, I say I'm not following against Sp uh, Spring a lot. What I, what I can tell you, Quarkus is uh, huge. Um, uh Got lots of questions regarding Corcus still, you know, workshops, projects, a lot is going on there, and uh, uh, Micronaut as well. And Helidon is less popular, but also really interesting framework, and uh, with uh, already integrated with Loom and uh, and also Quarkus, and um, they are really fresh and and uh, and built, you know, from ground up to f as as cloud environments. Okay. Okay, then um, I think we are done, right? Uh, what percentage of project would you say you use optimistic locking? I think in all of them. I cannot remember where I did something pessimistically, because pessimistically is always problematic. So I think all of project or try now to 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 change the business logic towards optimistic locking. Um, Uh, Kotlin coroutine and Java virtual threat. I think because uh, Kotlin will run on JVM, uh, Kotlin will have to adapt virtual threats. As simple as that. So, and if you're using uh, in Java 21, I don't know when the virtual threats will be released. Then Java plain developers are in advantage because, uh, or Kotlin will adopt adopt that from day one. But Java virtual threats are backed into the JVM. So they are very low level. So, pot, so Kotlin will have to use them. So, and this is one of the advantages of being Java as a developer. You can actually use all the bytecode features, and you know all programming language which are running on top of JVM. Uh, they need time, you know, to catch up. So actually, actually, you can put it this way. So to be cutting edge, you have to use you no know, plain Java. <laughs> um. Okay. What's what's the difference between system test, integration test, and unit test? Very simple. The unit test is completely mocked out environment. Integration test, I would say I'm I'm able to boot JPA without starting the entire server. And system test is black box or end-to-end -end tests. Not my names, I found them in Wikipedia. So that's that's the history. What will happen if give a Java app in production minimal RAM uh, available? Uh, you will get, you know, uh, GC runs, which run too often. Then um, you will have lots of stop the world problems. And then you get out of memory error. 
or there's another interesting error. It is like uh, it, it. I forgot the, the 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 complete name of the of the problem, but uh, uh, the the meaning is the uh, garbage collection is overloaded. So it's like out of memory, and uh, this is like the garbage collection will run all the time, and then you get the error. It's not out of memory error. It's like it's also not garbage collector collector is overloaded, but similar like this, right? Um, in Android, would I love coroutines? Bread, of course, but uh, if you don't have coroutines, you know, bread is a friend of the show, then you need some glue vine. <laughs> this is what we did, you know, on the AHEX uh, Winter Edition. And bread, um, uh, last week I was actually in our room in, in AHEX and uh, I booked the room, I told the story, because uh, other otherwise I wouldn't made, you know, the Java user group Zurich meeting. meeting. And I was alone, and I was you no know, live streaming to uh, to Cloud Builders Conference. Okay, and by the way, uh, the Cloud Builders Conference. If you search my Twitter, Cloud Builders Conf, they accept donations for a good purpose for 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 kids in Ukraine. So if you can, you know, you can also donate something. I will also have to do this. Um, okay, so I think I hoped or hoped I thought okay this time this show would be really short, but um, it was great as always. And um, um, maybe tradition, the next time you can also tune in a little bit earlier so we can have informal ch chat. So I will cut out everything, you know, until I will say welcome to whatever. So, uh, yeah, um, was fun. Thank you for watching and see you in May. So time flies. Uh, incredible. And Tiago, now maybe you you can catch up until May, right? So, <laughs> um, And uh, Tiago, of course, you should you know search for inconsistencies, what I said, you know, where I said something different back then, and now, you know, maybe, you know, I changed my mind or whatever. So it will be interesting to see. So um, thank you a lot. I think we are done. See you next time. Lots of fun. Uh, lots of conferences uh, around the corner. I will announce them in, in Meetup. If you like, see you in, uh, the, in the Airhex Discord, and I will put it to the chat. I think the name is Discord, uh, Discord, GG, for unknown reasons, and Airhex. And Ahex is the public name, this is the invitation, so you can, if you know, you know, the Ahex, this is the server name, you can just, uh, yeah, just stand. And uh, Pulumi is great, uh, uh, Daniel, but um, yeah. Thank you. See you next time, and bye.